let me begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to uh, spend some time here and to speak at this conference. So it's been a great pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, so let me um, first write down the equations I'll be studying. And so there are two equations I'm interested in. The first I'll call the gross Pitievsky. It has a parameter epsilon, and it looks like this. So the scaling is, uh, here's the epsilon. Uh, I'll also consider the elliptic uh, counterpart. So I'll call it Ginsburg-Landau with the epsilon. This is a bit of a misnomer, but. Okay, and then the setting for all this will be, uh, say, in three dimensions. Uh, in a cylindrical domain, so omega cross zero L, where little omega is a bounded open subset of R2, say, simply connected. Uh, in fact, uh, we can take it to be a ball if we like for most of the talk. And um, notation I'll use rather consistently is I'll write points in omega in the form um, x and z, where x is in uh, little omega, and z is the vertical, uh, the vertical variable. OK, so uh, these are my equations. Uh, for concreteness, let's say I'll consider, um, for example, uh, so this is the more interesting one. I'll, I'll consider for here, say, um, Neumann boundary conditions on the lateral boundary and periodic in the z direction. And here I would want probably some Dirichlet data, for example, somewhere. Um, OK, and so let me start by recalling some uh, relevant quantities. So these would include, uh, for example, the mass, or rather the density. Uh, there's a momentum, which I'll write in this way. So I'll, I'll, I'll consistently abuse notation in this fashion. So I'll write uh, a dot product here between two complex numbers to indicate the real dot product. So here I identify them as vectors between, as vectors in R2. Um, and so there's really the momentum density, the uh, free energy. Uh, and so this is the, uh, the quantity whose integral gives the uh, a conserved Hamiltonian for the gross Pitiazzi equation. And, um, and let me write this as, uh, I'll, I'll write a little j to denote the momentum. I'll call this E sub epsilon of u. And then finally, I'll define the vorticity. which I'll write um, as capital J of u. I can't call it omega because I called the domain of little omega. Capital J of u is um, one half of the curl of the momentum density. And um, it's a, a short calculation shows that this is in fact equal to, uh, again, if I identify uh, u as an R2 valued map with components u1 and u2, then this will just be the, in three dimensions, this is the cross product of say the real part, of the, the gradient of the real part and the gradient of the imaginary part. Okay, and so what this tells us uh, incidentally is that, um, of course, uh, this uh, gradient u1 is orthogonal to level sets of the real part. This is orthogonal to level sets of the imaginary part. And so the, and so the vorticity is orthogonal to both of these normals, and hence it's parallel to level sets of the complex value function. Um, and so if you like, a, you know, traditionally one defines a vortex filament as a integral curve of the vorticity vector field. Um, here, uh, because of this geometric property I've just described, such integral curves will just be level sets of the complex valued function, okay, uh, where, where, we, where things are non degenerate, and so on. Okay, and so there are um, a couple of conservation laws, a number of conservation laws that I will recall. And so, for example, um, conservation of mass uh, has the form okay, so this is the continuity equation. The time derivative of this is the divergence of that. Um, there's a conservation of momentum. And uh, I believe there's a two here, and then, okay, so I formed the three by three matrix whose uh, ij entry is the, the real inner product of the ith derivative and the jth derivative. I take the row-wise divergence. And then there's also a, a gradient term, which I won't care about much. Um, the reason I won't care about it is that I'm, I'm about to take the curl of this thing, and so, by, and so to 
understand how the vorticity evolves, I just take the curl of this equation, and I'll find that d d t the vorticity is uh, well. This disappears, and I have curl of divergence of grad u tensor grad u. Okay, so there's a nice evolution equation for the vorticity. Um, and finally, uh, the energy is also conserved formally, and it'll be conserved with the uh, with the boundary conditions I have here. And so, um, and so, for example, th th uh, this tells me that the total energy is constant. Uh, I'll be um, when I study the gross Petitjev equation, and actually also when I study the elliptic equation, I'll be interested in. Uh, in situations where the energy is of order log epsilon. This is natural for reasons we'll see in a second. And so if the energy is of order log epsilon, then in, in particular this uh, u squared minus 1 is, uh, is quite small in L2. And, um, and so it's convenient to think of this in this way. Uh, u squared minus 1 over epsilon is, uh, is, is uh, I guess, logarithmic in L2. And so this tells me that the divergence of j is small in the regime I'm interested in, is of order epsilon log epsilon maybe. Um, it's also true, in fact, uh, we'll see that in this, in this situation, in this regime where the energy is of order log epsilon, <coughs> that the vorticity has a huge amount of structure. And uh, we'll also, I mean, there, there are actually two ways of thinking of this. One is that uh, when I study the evolution equation, I'll put this structure in my initial data. Um, but more generally, it's true that under, uh, merely under the assumption of small energy, uh, the vorticity has a huge amount of structure uh, and so in particular, it, it, it'll be concentrated along one-dimensional curves in 3D. Uh, and away from those one-dimensional curves, it'll be close to zero. And so then this tells us what the divergence of the current is, is, uh, is small. Uh, the curl of the current, the vorticity, again, has structure. It's basically zero in a lot of places. It's, it lives on curves. And, on, and so we, we have a, a very good understanding of both the divergence and the curl of the current density. Or we will when I, uh, when I tell you more about what this is doing. Okay, so then um, let me describe a, uh, a special solution of both of these equations. It's simplest to uh, say what one refers to as a vortex solution. And so a special solution will be one who depends only on the horizontal x variables. This is independent of z and of t. And so for every integer d, let's write u upper d, uh, depending only on x, depending on the parameter epsilon, we'll, we'll have the form of a modulus uh, uh, writing it in polar coordinates, so it'll be e to the i d theta, uh, and then a modulus who depends on d and scales like r over epsilon. Okay, and so if you make this ansatz, then you get an ODE, let's say f d of 0 is 0, f d increases to 1 uh, as, uh, as the uh, radial parameter goes to infinity. Um, Okay, and so if you make this ansatz, you get ODE for FD, you can easily solve it. You can, you, you can find this in, in a number of ways. Uh, let's then remark some properties. And so the energy uh, density of this... Uh, so this, um, uh, away from the origin, this looks like it's, it's homogeneous of degree. Uh, away from the origin, it's basically this, right? So on a scale of order epsilon around the origin, of order epsilon, the modulus will be less than one. Away from the origin, it's basically e to the id theta. Uh, and so the energy of that will be like, um, say, a cutoff on a ball of radius epsilon times d squared over, uh, so the, um, if you just compute the, the energy of this, you get d squared over r squared. I think there's a factor of 2. Um, so this is, uh, and so for example, the energy, of, if, I, if I integrate this over a ball of radius epsilon, over ball raises R, excuse me, over a macros macroscopic ball. Uh, I'll get something, uh, I guess, D squared times log R over epsilon plus big O of 1. Okay, um, this is the reason, uh, this is, if you like, the, the basic reason I'll be interested in this logarithmic energy scale. This is the scale in which one sees these. Uh, so one thinks of this as being a basic uh, vortex and this logarithmic scale is the one on which vortices appear. Any questions? No? Excuse me, there's no z dependence on, on your special solutions? Uh, here, no. That's right, and so this is really a 2D solution. It's really 2D. Yeah. Um, 
And so, uh, and so you can think of it as being a cylinder, as being translation variant in the z direction and in the t direction. Um, another attribute of these solutions is if I look at the vorticity. Uh, well, this is really going to be, uh, I guess, pi times d, and then what's left will be an approximate identity. It'll have the form. And so this is really an approximate entity. OK, it is a smooth function. Who will be, uh, OK, so this is determined by the exact form of this, this f. Um, and maybe it'll depend on d. But, but uh, uh, this is a, a non-negative function with integral 1. Um, and we scaled in this fashion. OK, and so we can see here that the, uh, for this special solution, the vorticity is basically a smeared out delta function uh, around the origin with multiplicity d pi times the integer d. And the energy scales like d squared. Um, and what follows, I'll always be interested in d equals 1. We can see very naively uh, from this that uh, uh, if I call this a vortex, then a vortex of degree 2 costs uh, order uh, 4 pi uh, log uh, 1 over epsilon energy. Uh, and, so, and so two vortices of degree 1 are much cheaper energetically than one vortex of degree 2 is uh, worse. So vortices of degree plus or minus 1 have, have a, a sort of a uh, have strong instability properties, which are not possessed by other other vortices. Okay, and so the um, the ansatz I'm interested in is the following. So I want to look for uh, solutions of these two equations. What I would like is I want to my ansatz is I want to look for uh, u epsilon depending on who uh, who looks something like. Well, a product of, uh, I take the basic, say, degree one vortex on a scale epsilon uh, on each horizontal slice. And then I translate it by amount, uh, an amount depending on the vertical and time variables, f, i of z and t. Uh, OK, and so then. Um, if I look at a single, a single product, this is just, this is just the, the basic vortex uh, translated. Uh, and I, I multiply them together, I'll, I'll get a, and so the picture is this what it should look like. And uh, sorry, I'll, I also want to put a, uh, I want it to be a small translation, so it'll be a small scale h epsilon. Okay, and so the picture is. Sorry, are all these, I, I just got a little smeared, is there all the d equal one, each one? Yeah, these are all d equals one, that's right. Um, so these will all have the same sign in particular. Uh, one, uh, yeah. So the, the picture is on, on this small scale h epsilon. You hear there are these, uh, these vortices. And if I look at the certain height z, I will, I will see uh, these, these structures um, centered at points uh, f1 of z up to f sub n of z scaled uh, into this small tube. OK? So this is, the, uh, this is what I am interested in. This is the. Uh, situation I'd like to study. And um, let me say at the outset, so one might imagine uh, um, writing a solution as, and also let me add, uh, if I have boundary conditions, I may want to multiply this by a global phase function in order to satisfy those boundary conditions. Um, okay, so one might imagine um, uh, writing a solution of either of those equations as something of this form, uh, and then an error term, and then doing a linear analysis. Um, for whatever, for, for reasons, uh, well, it's just a, it's an empirical fact that this argument has not been carried out successfully for uh, any of the problems, for, 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 for essentially any of the problems I'm considering here, in, in, uh, for, especially for any, uh, any three-dimensional question for any of these, uh, for either of these problems or any, or any similar problem. And so somehow linearizing has not been successful for these questions. Um, but this is, the, this is the picture to have in mind. So, so this ansatz will not actually appear in any proofs. OK, and so, um, so in some way, the story I want to describe begins with work of uh, Del Pino. That was, this was mentioned by um, Valeria Banica yesterday and Kowalczyk from uh, 08, 2008. It was published. And, um, and so they show essentially, I'm going to uh, state this a bit, a bit uh, imprecisely, but they showed that um, 
well, let's look at the following quantity. I'll define this uh, G sub E of. So uh, let this be the integral over the domain of the total energy, of the energy density. And I want to rescale in a certain way. Uh, so I'll subtract off, um, it turns out the energy will diverge on a logarithmic scale, pi uh, n um, minus, uh, and I guess I need, uh, I need uh, L here as well, L being the length, the, being the vertical height of the domain, n pi L log epsilon minus n, n minus one, pi L log of the smaller scale h epsilon. So, the, so in fact, they show that in some sense, the, the correct scale to take is, will be h epsilon is log epsilon to the minus one half. Um, I'll tell you why this is an interesting scale in a moment. Um, then there's some uh, constant that depends on n and the domain omega. Uh, OK, so they, they um, essentially they define this, and they said that if we consider um, g epsilon of the above ansatz. Uh, and, and so built into this rescaling is the fact that I'm considering something with n, uh, n vortex lines, the parameter n is, is there. G epsilon of the ansatz uh, is equal to, I guess, uh, pi over 2 fi okay, something over i and then uh, a logarithmic interaction term, so some involving i and j different. I think there's a pi here also, a log of fi minus fj of z, the whole thing integrated with respect to the z variable. Um, and so their theorem was that this is true up to uh, little over one error terms. And they showed also that these little over one error terms are, uh, in some way depend um, smoothly on, uh, on, uh, on f on the lines f here. Um, and I'll call this, I'll call this g0. This is the, so, uh, okay, and uh, just uh, one or two remarks about this. Of course, the, um, the choice I make for the phase here will affect the uh, constant I get there. And, and, and part of the point of the paper of Del Pino and Kowalczyk was to, um, was to make a choice of the phase, which is, you know, I guess they, don't, uh, they didn't prove uh, upper bounds. This is only lower bounds. They're, they're commuting the energy of a, of a test function. But to make a choice which is, uh, which is presumably uh, a good one and close to optimal that makes this term as small as possible. Um, and, so, and so in some way, they identified the right uh, constant here, which is connected to the right uh, phase there. Um, okay, and so based on this, one can conjecture that, uh, well, they, uh, I think they either conjectured or came close to conjecturing that there should be solutions of the gross Petietsky equation. Well, uh, well, say for the elliptic equation, one would expect to see, one might, one might hope at least to see solutions of the elliptic equation, uh, which have uh, roughly this form for uh, uh, F, a map from zero L into uh, uh, N fold copy of R2 um, for F being a critical point of this energy function, or, or the, yeah, sorry, for F a critical point here. And one might, one might further hope to have solutions of the gross Petietsky equation of this form, where F solves us some kind of Schrodinger equation associated with this Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is the, um, these, uh, I think the first conjecture was explicit in the paper of Del Pino and collaborators, and the second one may have been implicit. Uh, sorry, I should say Kowalczyk and collaborators. <laughs> so, um, and let, let me remark also, uh, there's an earlier, I think they were in some way motivated by an earlier paper of Montero, Sternberg, and Zimmer, who showed that uh, for suitable geometries, so they were considering the elliptic problem in certain 3D domains. The domain looked like this. They imagine a a surface of revolution generated by this, uh, uh, by this figure. And so, uh, and, and so the it doesn't have to be a, 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 a surface of revolution, uh, rather a, a 3D domain of revolution. But the point is that you want a geometry for which there's a local minimizer of the arc length functional um, connecting two points on the boundary. 
And so what they showed is that there exist solutions of the Ginzburg Landau equation for small epsilon, um, such that the uh, energy density uh, divided by the rescaling, divided by the diversion logarithmic factor, converges to uh, n pi times Hausdorff one-dimensional measure, restricted to the segment, um, say L here. And uh, similarly, the vorticity um, converges to a uh, welded vector 0, 0, 1, if you uh, will forgive a abuse notation times the same thing. And so one, one understands this as saying that for these solutions, one has a, a n quanta of vorticity concentrating around this curve. Um, and so I, I think part of the motivation of, uh, of these authors was to, um, was, was to ask, uh, well, on, on smaller scales, uh, what's the fine, the fine scale structure of, uh, of these solutions? Um, okay, and let me say also a, uh, I won't write this down, but a main tool in the uh, Sternberg and in the Montero Sternberg Zimmer theorem were earlier results of myself and Soner and Alberto, uh, Alberti Baldo Orlandi. Um, okay, so then. Okay, and so then. Uh, let me state the main results of this talk, which are the following. So the first is joint work with Andres Contreras. Which uh, addresses, this. so really, um, uh, let's say as a corollary, it will address the elliptic problem. And uh, let's say, um, so assume that uh, I have a sequence u epsilon uh, in h1 omega complex valued functions um, with the following two properties. And so, so the first will say that I want to see, uh, say, um, n vortex filaments concentrating on this. Uh, so from, from now on, h sub epsilon always denotes this uh, log epsilon to the minus 1 half length scale. And so I'd like to see, um, let's write it this way. So at each, uh, if I look at the, um, uh, I'll write over here, I guess, J sub X of U is just the uh, Jacobian with respect to the X components. And so this is the horizontal gradient of U1. Well, that's, if you like, it's the determinant of the horizontal gradient of U viewed as a real value as, as an arbitrary value map. So um, I want I'd like this to look like a bunch of delta functions to leading order, uh, concentrated near the origin. So w minus one one in omega d z. Uh, let me ask this to be okay. And so this tells me that if I look at uh, so so heuristically, if I look at a, at a given slice, um, then uh, on the average I'll see n vortices within this h epsilon scale of the vertical axis. Um, we assume this, and I'll, I'll also assume that this uh, g epsilon of u epsilon, that the energy rescaled in the above fashion by subtracting off the correct diversion part, that this is bounded by some constant c2. Uh, so I want these to, be, to hold uniformly in epsilon. Um, so the conclusions are that uh, after passing to a subsequence, We have um, the. Uh, let me let me uh, do the following. So I'd like to I'd like to um, rescale in the horizontal directions. So let's let v epsilon of x and z be uh, u epsilon of h epsilon x and z. And so v and so v is I, I've expanded the domain. I've I've moved the h epsilon scale out to order one. Um, this. It satisfies that the um, horizontal vorticity of V uh, converges, say, in W minus 1, 1, 
to a measure who is concentrated on um, this is on uh, the graph over the vertical axis of n uh, h1 curves. C of the n. Um, and so this converges to, I guess, pi times the sum. Okay. Um, uh, and so what I mean here, I guess this is an expanding domain. I mean, for every, uh, if I fix a big ball, then for epsilon small enough, the domain, the rescale domain will contain that ball. And so I mean, uh, for example, on W minus one, one of a big ball across zero L for every, uh, for every, for every R. Um, okay, so after passing the subsidies, there exists an F such that this holds. And uh, moreover, uh, whenever this holds, then the, um, the limit from the energies, G epsilon, is uh, greater than G zero of F. Okay, and so this is uh, so one can one can view this as basically a uh, a lower bound to complement the upper bound of Delpino and Kowalczyk. This shows that the upper bound of Delpino and Kowalczyk is sharp. Um, Uh, in other words, for any f, I can construct a sequence u epsilon such that this holds in such a heavy quality here. And um, a few other conclusions, uh, which I won't uh, write down at the moment. Um, okay, and so this is the uh, first thermistic corollary. Let's uh, let me state this not too precisely. Uh, so the corollary, corollary would be that in our in our geometry that there exist. Um, solutions of the Ginzburg Landau epsilon equation. Okay, so here to be uh, I will, to, to be precise, I'm considering um, uh, Dirichlet data on the uh, top and bottom and Neumann data on the sides. And the, and the point of the Dirichlet data will be to force the presence of this of n vortex lines um, near the origin. Okay, so there's just solutions of this equation such that uh, if you like the uh, these um, such that uh, after rescaling uh, in this fashion the rescaled the uh, rescaled Jacobians converge to and I mean uh, so I guess I mean. Uh, Right, and so this, this measure has this form of a sum of delta functions on every z, and then I integrate in the z direction. Um, okay, and so this tells us uh, for these uh, solutions, um, the vorticity is indeed, and sorry, and f i is a critical point of the limiting function, indeed a minimizer, uh, subject to suitable boundary conditions. Okay, and so this says that indeed, uh, uh, while not giving the kind of um, sort of precise uh, point-wise description in terms of the ansatz that uh, Kowalczyk and Delpino may have had, may have had in mind, um, this does say that for these sequence of solutions, the vorticity is concentrating around uh, around curves who are uh, who minimize this limiting function. Okay, that's uh, theorem one, and the second theorem is a dynamic theorem, and so. Uh, And this is a joint work with D.J. Smith's, which, uh, so these are different 16s. That 16 means it was, it was uh, submitted, I mean, it was, it was posted recently. And the 16 means it's quite underway at the moment. And so this is, uh, we've, we've uh, and so uh, I have to thank the organizer for this. I mean, so this, this stay in Paris has given us the opportunity to uh, make progress on this problem. 
Okay, and so theorem two says, um, let me consider, uh, oh, I guess I should make uh, remarks about, uh, some remarks about this. And so, um, so, uh, okay, without writing down names, let me just mention, uh, there's a huge amount of related work uh, on the Ginzburg-Landau equation in 3D. Um, and so in some, uh, I guess I have to, Um, so uh, some, a lot of this follows from, um, say, seminal work of Beth Walbrzee's in the early 90s on the Ginsburg-Land equation in 2D. Uh, people who contribute, and, so, and so the general picture in 3D is that one uh, is that in the limit one epsilon is small, uh, energy and vorticity concentrate around um, around uh, lines, and more generally in in n dimensions where n greater than equal to three energy and vorticity concentrated on co-dimension two minimal surfaces. Uh, this is the general picture. And so uh, this has been studied, for example, a major conversion include, uh, so in more or less chronological order, Bethwell and Riviere, Lynn and Riviere, uh, Bethwell, Brazis, Orlandi, uh, Bethwell, Bourgain, Brazis, Orlandi, Bethwell, Orlandi, Smits, uh, et cetera. So these, uh, these all made important contributions to this analysis. And, and so, um, of, of course, in 3D, a minimal surface is a line. And, and what this is doing is giving a, dis a description of the uh, of the uh, fine scale structure in the case of uh, higher degree concentration of vorticity around a, around a line. Um, this is also related in a way to, uh, so uh, another parallel is with the scalar analog of the ginsburg landau equation, so the, the allen kahn equation. And so there one sees there's a phenomenon of what one calls interface, uh, interface clustering. And so there are two interfaces are connected in some way to uh, mineral surfaces. And one can have multiple interfaces clustering around a single mineral surface. Um, there's a lot of rather recent work on this by people including uh, Del Pino, Kowalczyk, Way, uh, well, let, let's say Del Pino, Kowalczyk, Way, Peckhard, um, and, and uh, basically uh, various subsets of, in, in fact, uh, uh, subsets of those permutations. There are a, few other, a few other authors have contributed also, as well as a paper of Kowalczyk, uh, Liu, and Peckhard or a paper of Del Pino, Kowalczyk, Wei, and Young. And, and so um, a lot of recent work on interface clustering. This is the, uh, the par a, a par uh, say a first parallel result in higher dimensions showing vortex clustering. Um, okay, so theorem two then would be, and so uh, henceforth I'm going to always state things in terms of a rescaled variable V uh, rather than U. And so let me write down what the equation, I'm gonna study the gross pity equation. Let me write down what it looks like after this rescaling. And so I'll have, uh, say, minus, uh, I guess I want to. So um, the rescaling is anisotropic with respect to x and z. Uh, giving rise to certain log logarithmic factors in certain places. Okay, and so this will, for example, uh, give rise to rescaled versions of these uh, of these conservation laws, um, and uh, rescaled versions of the conserved quantities. So uh, I'd like to assume this. I'd like to assume that. Um, I'd like to assume that the vorticity initially concentrates, well, it has these properties. Um, I guess it's not written here. So the, this converges, uh, we, we can make a conversion, the, the, the precise essence doesn't matter, but let's say W minus one one, or, uh, or this uh, topology over here. Um, this will converge to, So, okay, so we have um, something like this, and again, I, I keep on forgetting this uh, 
Okay, so at every height I have n vortices and then I integrate in the z direction. This is true, and also I, I want to then assume that I have the uh, minimal energy possible given this conservation condition, and the minimal energy is given by this. Um, so g epsilon after rescaling. Um, when I rescale, I get some logs in certain places. Uh, that this should converge to g naught of this f zero. And here uh, f uh, f uh, f naught denotes a is a um, smooth solution and. Say uh, H4 is enough, uh, continuous into H4. Of exactly the, exactly the um, uh, Hamiltonian system associated to, to G0, um, which is exactly the um, model that Valeri Banica spoke about yesterday in her talk. And so this is. So F naught solves uh, I D T F naught minus the second and there are components J Okay, so I, I, uh, I assume I have a smooth solution of the uh, of this limiting system, and the, and I assume that at time zero, the energy and vorticity are concentrating around the curves who give the initial data for this solution. The conclusion is that then for t in here, uh, again the uh, vorticity uh, converges to. Um, the vorticity associated to the solution here, F0 at time T, tensor DZ. Um, this is true. And similarly, the, uh, the energy also converges to the same thing, in fact. Okay, let's, uh, well, I guess this is... Uh, Okay, let's, let's leave it at that. Okay, uh, we have more conclusions which I've written down. And so, um, and so uh, what this says is that, um, right, uh, it says, so, so in other words, what this is, this is a derivation of the equation studied by Valeria Banica yesterday. And so let's remember um, from Valeria's talk, this was first um, formally written down by guys in the fluids community by, um, Klein, Maida, and Damodaran in the mid-90s, uh, following earlier work of Zakharov in the late 80s. And, um, and basically the way these guys argue is by matched formal asymptotics. And so this is, as far as we know, the first, or I mean, it's not even the first, uh, because it's not finished yet, but, when it, but we, we hope this will be the first uh, uh, rigorous derivation in any setting of, uh, of this model for the dyna dynamics of thin, uh, nearly parallel vortex filaments. Um, starting from an equation for uh, with fluid dynamical problems. I, I should have said the gross Pitekevsky equation in principle describes um, superfluids and so uh, quantum mechanical fluids. And so rather than looking at a, uh, say a classical ideal fluids as, as described by the older equations, we're considering their, quant their quantum counterparts, which in some ways uh, uh, the analysis is much easier in the quantum case, in the uh, gross Pitekevsky case. Okay, and so um, let me note here, uh, in this setting, all the vortices have the same sign. Uh, and so one would like to be able to do this for vortices of, of opposite sign. Um, if, if, uh, that's what one sees in, uh, in these trailing vortices of airplanes, for example. However, I mean, vortices of the same sign actually appears to be more relevant in the quantum context, but who knows. Um, and then, uh, 
So, so concerning this equation, uh, Valeria summarized yesterday uh, a lot of the history, and so this includes work of uh, Will Klein, Mada, Damodaran, who derived it, then Kenneth Ponce and Vega. Um, uh, lots of work of, of Banneke and Mio, also recent work of Walter Craig and Carlos Garcia as Pietia. And I think there's also work of uh, Garcia Pietia and uh, Ize. Um, and so one can sort of mention all the, uh, essentially everyone who's worked on this in, uh, in uh, a sentence or two. Okay, and so, um, and so in the remaining eight minutes, I'll say a bit about the proof. And um, so here's how this goes. Uh, and so the, the overall point is that the, um, the proof relies incredibly strongly on, on uh, well, say, on things in the spirit of theorem 1, which is here, I think. So um, in, in theorem 1, we assume only uh, some kind of uh, sort of crude knowledge about the vorticity. We say that we have n vortices concentrating on a certain scale about the origin, about, about this line. And we assume that in energy bounds. And then we deduce various conclusions. And so in the dynamical setting, we will uh, we'll choose initially such that these, uh, these hypotheses hold. And, uh, and if we can show that these persist in time, then we have access to these conclusions and, uh, and uh, further conclusions in the same spirit. And so, the, um, and so a large part of this, there's a, there's a theorem three, so to speak, which is, uh, again, uh, uh, will be in the paper of myself in DDA, which, uh, which is sort of a refinement of these results. Under, under the same or similar hypotheses, we, we extract still further information about the behavior of the vorticity in, in these uh, solutions. And so, um, but about the proof. So if we consider, uh, let's call this the, uh, uh, interacting vortex filament system. So, so here's the point. Um, if uh, so, suppose F and F naught solve this, then it's an easy computation to show that the that um, this is bounded by a constant times this. Okay, so what I want to do, I'd like to do the same thing if possible for if F naught solving this and uh, F obtained from the gross Pityevsky equation in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And so, uh, and so, let me suppose that I've somehow d uh, arranged that at, at every time uh, these things, these conditions hold at every time in some interval. And so, at every time, I can I can pass the limits along some subsequence and get some limiting f that will depend on time. Um, if I have some kind of equal continuity in time, I can do this. I can find a signal subsequence uh, for which I get convergence along a time interval. Um, and so, we, and so, if we try to mimic this computation, we'll find that well, for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. Um, I get this, but then I get errors arising from the fact that uh, this is not the right equation. I have to do some approximations. And um, these errors look like, and, and, and when I say uh, F comes from this, I mean under my hypotheses, under my hypothesis of, of rather sharp energy bounds, well bred data. Um, okay, there's some extra energy here. And so, um, and so the idea is that if uh, it, it's possible that, so I have a, I have a lower bound here. Um, the limiting vortex filaments can have at most, uh, at most this much energy. They may, may, they may lose a bit of energy. Energy may leak from the vortices into the rest of the fluid. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, if, uh, th th that's kind of an enemy you have to be controlled. Um, one thing we can do, however, is we can replace this by the first variation by a linear term. Let's write it like this. Uh, and then I get quadratic terms, which turn out to involve only the L2 norm, not the, eight, not, the, not the derivatives. And so I can absorb the quadratic terms into here, and I get a linear term. Um, 
okay, uh, but then I'm, I'm still left controlling something who's linear in F by something who's quadratic. That doesn't look very good. Uh, however, it's also true if I go back to the, uh, this system that for the linear term in question, Uh, one has this, uh, one has this uh, estimate, and again, this is uh, straightforward. And so, um, and the point is then, well, I, when I go over here and again do the same approximation, approximation arguments and so on, I'll find that for uh, f coming from the uh, gross Petiesi limit, um, this is bounded by uh, the same. Expressions, and so at this point, I'm able to do a Grunwald inequality, and proceed. Uh, the um, of course, all of the work has been has been obtained in uh, this assertion that I can do this, and so let me uh, let me um, say a little bit about that in the remaining three minutes, if I can. Okay, good. So then, uh, so what I want to do then is to use the, um, is to use this equation, the equation that tells me how the vortex is moving. Remember, the vortex is telling me where the curves are. And so let me multiply this, I rescale, I write things in terms of V instead of U. I multiply the vortex by test function phi. And uh, after the rescaling, I'll find, well, there'll be a term phi sub t. Uh, there'll be a term epsilon. So here i and j are, well, let's write it like this. Um, uh, I have the horizontal derivatives of phi and then the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product with something, the uh, tensor product of v perp with v. And then I have um, d, z, the horizontal derivative of phi, and the dot product with uh, okay, the anisotropic rescaling gives rise to log epsilon here. Uh, I'd like to pass the limits in this expression, and uh, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a I'll take a phi who, uh, for example, looks like one half x minus f not of z t squared. Um, okay, and so then I better uh, sum over the components and multiply by cutoff functions. Okay, and so then formally at least, uh, well actually, uh, then it's really true that the, the phi times the Jacobian converges to uh, as, long as, uh, as long as the limiting curves are supported in the region where these cutoff functions are one. Um, this thing will, will really converge to the L2 norm. Um, the L2 norm squared. And similarly, this will converge to, uh, we know what this is doing. This will give us some um, different pieces of, of, uh, of that computation. Um, and so we have to, in particular, we have to know what this is doing. Uh, and so it's a fact that this is converging. Uh, so this is one of the things proved in the theorem three I didn't write down. Uh, this is converging to um, d, z. So I, I, if I fix a time, a time t, um, then this will converge to, uh, so, uh, it'll converge to a measure supported along the curve, along the vortex curves. Uh, involving the, uh, the vertical derivative of the limiting curve. Okay, so these, these, these come from the limit. And uh, whereas this involves, um, if you look at it, this involves the, uh, this is just um, where the cutoff function is equal to one. This is just equal to uh, minus dz of f naught of the, uh, of the solution. Okay. And so here we have, so, so this will give rise to a term involving the, orth the, orth the orthogonal gradient of dz of f naught and dz of f, right? The thing I obtained from the limit. And um, this is the, hardest term by far, and I don't have time to talk about that. So let me stop here. Thank you. Questions? Yes. So <coughs>
is there another geometric context of this? Maybe some domain in which not cylindrical, maybe some other geometric interest in geometric context. Well, right. So uh, I'd say for the uh, for Gross-Pitekovsky cylindrical or um, an unbounded cylinder or all of R three are the natural context. And so the uh, as as I think Valeria said. This limiting system has been studied most on, on the real line. And so for that, we'd need a, a domain who's unbounded in the z direction. Um, that would be possible. I mean, for, for the elliptic equation, uh, yeah, so there, there what's much more interesting is, is exactly the interplay between the geometry of the domain and, uh, and the geometry in the limiting solutions. And so, for example, one could presumably do the same thing, uh, well, but it would be harder. And so one could look for, uh, if I have a three-dimensional manifold, with a geodesic, a closed geodesic. One could look for um, uh, solutions with, uh, with N filaments concentrating on small scales around the geodesic. But that uh, would be a bit harder. Yeah, okay. Actually, I actually have the same, same question, but just slightly different so for my own purposes. You put uh, directly boundary transitions at, at zero and L, or, or was it? Yeah. Can you put periodic? Um, you can. I mean, the um, right. So we we have a. I mean, this 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 corollary says really if we have a if we have a um, a local minimizer of the limiting functional, then we get local minimizing solutions of the epsilon functional. And so in in the if I just have if I just have n curves, uh, if they're not uh, uh, if they're not linked in some way. Then, uh, then they'll always want to spread apart and lower their energy. Um, so there, there presumably are, you know, uh, uh, let me remark also this is. Um, so the Dirac conditions make you fit, allow you to fix the curves at the, at the end. Yeah, that's right. And in principle, they could also be fixed by, um, by nodding. If I, so the limiting equation in the elliptic case is just this without the uh, time derivative. Uh, and if you look at it, this is, this is really a planar n body problem where z plays the role of the uh, time variable. Uh, and uh, and so people have constructed um, solutions. We we didn't, however, uh, uh, t t t uh, the thing we didn't do was to identify knotted solutions who are local minimizers of some energy, which is what we would need to do to uh, to relate them to these. But the time dynamics, I mean, the time dynamics allows you to give initial data and yeah, follow sure. them for a period of time. Yeah. And that wouldn't cause the, this. You wouldn't need a minimizer. Uh, no, that's right. Good. Any other questions? If not, I 